Hi, this is Michael Altos, and we're continuing our discussion of endocrine drugs, and this is recording part three. Insulin is a peptide synthesized in pancreatic beta cells. Its primary function is facilitating transport of glucose into cells. It also causes potassium to be transported into cells. Insulin shifts the metabolism of the body towards storage, formation of glycogen and synthesis of lipids, and stimulates protein synthesis, so it is an anabolic hormone. Normally, insulin is secreted at a rate of about one unit per hour at rest. However, the body ends up secreting 40 to 50 units a day, primarily in response to food. Alpha adrenergic stimulation decreases insulin levels, and beta stimulation and parasympathetic stimulation increase insulin. Insulin receptors actually get saturated at relatively low insulin concentrations. And for this reason, you'll notice that a one to two unit per hour continuous infusion may be more effective than giving a large bolus. Now, large boluses do take longer to clear than small boluses, so you may have a greater net effect, but you may have a more physiologic effect and a more efficient effect by using an infusion instead of just giving occasional boluses. It's metabolized in the kidneys and the liver with a half time of about five to 10 minutes, but because it's so tightly bound to receptors, regular insulin has a sustained effect of 30 to 60 minutes. When we administer insulin, the biggest risk is hypoglycemia. For this reason, we don't want to be too aggressive. Usually our target blood glucose is, 100, is below 180. Patients who have insulin resistance will need more insulin in order to achieve a given effect. Preoperatively, we instruct our patients to not take short-acting insulin on the day of surgery because they're NPO. And if they take long-acting insulin, they should cut that dose usually in half. Patients with implanted insulin pumps may turn them off or put them on a continuous infusion and inform us. Intraoperatively, it's always best to use a sliding scale to manage hyperglycemia. And we'll look at an example of a protocol in just a moment. As a rule of thumb, one unit of regular insulin will lower plasma glucose by about 25 to 30 milligrams per deciliter in a normal adult, with an onset of 10 minutes, a peak action in 15 to 30 minutes, and a total duration of 30 to 60 minutes. Obviously, these numbers won't be the same in patients who have insulin resistance. An insulin infusion can be started at a rate of 0.1 units per kilogram per hour, or by taking the plasma glucose and dividing it by 150 and using that as your units per hour. When starting an insulin infusion, it's recommended that you waste about 10 cc's through the tubing because some of the drug will be absorbed into the plastic tubing. Here's an example of an insulin protocol. It has two parts, the initiation and then the titration. The initiation looks at the patient's starting blood glucose and determines what their bolus should be and what their initial infusion should be at. Every hour, blood glucose should be checked and then, if the blood glucose has decreased by more than 30, this column of instructions is followed. Whereas if it's decreased by less than 30 or has increased, then a more aggressive set of instructions follows. This is then repeated every hour. This chart is a summary of some of the more common types of insulin that you may see. The short-acting insulins, like Aspart and Lispro, which have very short onsets, peak within an hour, and last for anywhere from two to six hours. Regular insulin, which has an onset of 30 to 60 minutes, peaks in two to four hours and lasts six to eight. NPH is longer acting. And then finally, Glargine or Lantus, which takes about an hour and a half to work, has no peak and lasts for 24 to 30 hours and is used for a basal insulin rate. Glucagon can be thought of as the anti-insulin. It's secreted not from the beta, but from the alpha cells of the pancreas. And it is stimulated to be released from hypoglycemia, stress, trauma, cortisol, and sepsis. It has the opposite action of insulin. 
It mobilizes glucose, fatty acids, and amino acids into the circulation and increases liver production of glucose. Glucagon isn't a catecholamine, but since it increases cyclic AMP, just like catecholamines do, we'll see some similar effects. It increases myocardial contractility, stroke volume and heart rate, and it works even in the presence of beta blockade. Glucagon increases the secretion of bile, and you may be asked to give it during an ERCP procedure in order to open up the, uh, the, in order to open up the pancreatic duct. Side effects of glucagon include nausea, vomiting, and hyperglycemia, and it has a short elimination half time of three to six minutes. We should spend a few minutes discussing medications other than insulin, and we call these oral glucose lowering agents. I'll summarize a few key points on this slide and then show you a chart on the next slide, which is reproduced in your notes. The classic oral drug were sulfonylurea drugs. These are drugs that increase beta cell activity and therefore lead to more insulin secretion. Therefore, their primary side effect would be hypoglycemia. Obviously, these drugs won't work in a patient who does not have functioning beta cells, so they would not commonly be used in a type 1 diabetic or a type 2 diabetic whose beta cells are no longer functioning effectively. The second category are the biguanides. The most common is metformin. This is a drug that inhibits hepatic gluconeogenesis. It converts lactate into glucose. Classically, there was a risk of lactic acidosis in patients who took biguanides, and for that reason, they were not taken on the day of surgery. In fact, the risk of lactic acidosis is very low uh, with metformin compared with older biguanides, and there isn't any evidence to support stopping these medications on the day of surgery. Also, because they don't drop blood sugar, they only prevent conversion of lactate into glucose, there's a, a low risk for hypoglycemia when patients take metformin. A general principle for the oral glucose lowering agents is that, in general, we can often maintain therapy on these agents on the day of surgery unless a significant interruption of caloric intake is anticipated. And so we have to consider the patient's underlying uh, management of their diabetes, the timing of the surgery, and the expected post-operative course. Looking at this table, uh, I've highlighted the sulfonylureas and metformin in bold. Those are the two drugs that you should definitely understand, um, with examples given of all the different kinds of drugs and mechanisms, as I've mentioned already. We have some recommendations for how you would approach these drugs, both on the day before a short ambulatory surgery as well as management on the day of surgery. So moving quickly through this chart, we have the sulfonylureas. Examples include gliburide, uh, glimepiride. These drugs stimulate the pancreatic beta cells to secrete insulin. These drugs can be taken on the day before surgery, but attention should be paid to the time of NPO and to the time of surgery the next morning. On the day of surgery, we would not want patients to take these drugs, um, although they can restart them after food intake is resumed. Biguanides like metformin, which goes by the brand name glucophage. Uh, as we said, these inhibit uh, production of glucose from hepatic, uh, a hepatic production of glucose from lactic acid. Um, they also um, inhibit insulin resistance. These drugs can be continued um, leading up to surgery, um, unless there's a question about contrast use and possible renal failure. And these drugs can be started within 24 hours after surgery, um, assuming renal function is stabilized. Um, obviously, if it's a minor surgery with no renal risk, then there really isn't any concern. The thiazolidine dienes, which include drugs like pioglitazone, rosaglitazone, Actos, and Avandia, these drugs enhance insulin sensitivity. They're called PPAR gamma agonists, and they increase glucose uptake as well. These drugs can be continued in the days up to surgery and can be continued through the perioperative period, as they do not pose any direct risk for hypoglycemia. The alpha-glucosidase inhibitors, commonly acarbose, also called precos, are drugs that inhibit intestinal glucose secretion and absorption. These drugs can also be continued in the days before surgery and can be restarted once food intake is resumed. The DPP-4 inhibitors, where DPP stands for dipeptidyl peptidase, these are drugs like Trigenta and Genuvia, 
Um, they all end in glyptine. These drugs inhibit degradation of the incretin hormone, which is called GLP-1, and they enhance insulin secretion. Despite this, they can be continued prior to and during the perioperative period as they do not significantly increase risk of hypoglycemia. The last category on this chart are the SGLT2 inhibitors. SGLT is sodium glucose cotransporter 2, and these are drugs that end in glyphlozin. Um, you may have heard some of the brand names such as Invocana. These are drugs that inhibit renal glucose reabsorption and basically they cause glucosuria. They cause patients to excrete glucose in their urine. These drugs can be continued prior to surgery and should be stopped on the morning of, of surgery and restarted after food intake is resumed. That's the end of this recording. Please let me know if you have questions about any of the material and we will continue in the next recording.